Welcome, everybody, to the latest edition of Stars, Cells, in God. This is the show where we take a look at the discoveries that are happening at the frontiers of science and describe how these discoveries provide evidence for God's existence, God's character, and the reliability of scriptures. My name is Fuzz Rana. I'm a biochemist and a Christian apologist, and I work for an organization called Reasons to Believe. This is the organization that sponsors this podcast. If you want to know more about Reasons to Believe, I invite you to our website, www.reasons.org. Also, you can follow us on social media, RTB underscore official. And then, of course, please go to our YouTube channel, Reasons to Believe, and subscribe. There you can gain access to all kinds of great content uh, that addresses a wide range of questions relating to science in the Christian faith. And then also use the bell icon so that you can be informed when new episodes of Star Cells and God drops. Uh, I'm, I'm joined in studio today by Dr. Tassos uh, Lycurgo, and uh, Dr. Uh, Lycurgo is a here as a visiting scholar at Reasons to Believe, and today we're going to be talking about the laws of logic and how the laws of logic provide evidence for God's existence, and also what do they mean about who we are as human beings. Uh, Dr. Lycurgo is a trained philosopher, a lawyer. He's also a university professor, and so we're so grateful to have him here with us. Uh, Tassos, uh, thank you for being here. My pleasure. Thank you for inviting me, for having me here. It's, it's a privilege to be here to talk t with you about such, a, in, such an important subject. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Um, before we get started, uh, <clears throat> I think the audience might be curious about who you are. So maybe just give us a little bit of an introduction to yourself, uh, some of your academic and professional accomplishments, and also um, how you uh, came to embrace the Christian faith. Yeah, I'm from Brazil. I lived there. You know, I became a Christian like 21 years ago. Okay. Uh, used to be an atheist, right? As many of the apologists, they used to be atheists, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, at that time, my wife was pregnant and you know, my son got healed. And so my wife got converted, and she went. She began to go to a church, Baptist church, over there. And then I started to go as well, but I wasn't a Christian at that time, right? So for some reason, one book came to my hands, uh, Mere Christianity by C.S. Lewis. Mm. I was really impressed by the book, uh, how profound it is, and mm. the way he addresses the questions. And from that point on, I tried to study more. You know, got some different books uh, by Hugh Ross, Bill Craig, uh, Norman Geisler, and I was really impressed by this mm. literature. So, and at that time, I was convinced, but I wasn't really a Christian, right? This is <clears throat> very interesting because you can come to a point where you think that Christianity is the truth, but you're not a Christian. Mm, right, yeah. the mind doesn't convert you. Right? So, but it cleans it cleans the obstacles between you, between you and the and the gospel, right? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and so I, I my my wife got pregnant again, and that time my daughter uh, passed away. Uh, she died, and it was a very heavy time. And mm -hmm. and uh, during that situation, during that difficult situation, I had to make a decision. So I really gave my my life to the Lord at that time. It's a, it's interesting because when I see that situation backwards in nowadays, I really understand that uh, you know the conversion is more than mere philosophically. You know, it's not it's not something only that only mm -hmm. in the intellect is more than that. It has a an existential aspect. Mm -hmm. So from that point on, I became a Christian. Yeah. Yeah. Now, tell us a little bit about uh, uh, some of your professional accomplishments, yeah. your academic background. 
um, because that's going to be very important as you begin to talk to us about the laws of logic, because I think you're somebody we should be paying attention to. Yeah, I went to, I, uh, I undergraduate in ph philosophy, uh -huh. and then I went to Norway for a while. I studied there in the north of Norway during that time and in Brazil. And then I went to England, got my master's there in analytic, analytical philosophy. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and I did also a PhD in education and um, in law in law. I'm a lawyer, right? And basically, that's th the yeah. thing, right? I mean, in other little courses. That, yeah. Uh, yeah. And you're a professor. Um, what is the university that you're yeah, a professor? Yeah, I'm a, a full professor at the Federal University of uh, Rio Grande do Norte, is the name of the state. Yeah. Brazil has public universities all over. They are the largest and uh -huh. best universities in Brazil. The federal ones. Is yeah. <clears throat> I'm a professor, a lawyer, in a I'm a pastor as well. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So you have a ministry. Uh, what is the name of your ministry? Yeah. Is defense of faith in Portuguese is defesa da fé, defense okay. of faith in English. It's uh, the ministry. Yeah. Uh, the ministry uh, it was founded before the church. Actually, okay. the church we founded the church because there were some some people that they were looking for a church where yeah. questions could be made. Yeah. Uh, so we started the church nine years ago. Well, that's interesting. So this is a place where people can come in and and you're encouraging the congregation to ask their difficult questions. Yeah, especially the kids. Yeah. When they get like eight, nine, ten years old, it's very bad if you go to them and say, Don't question don't know people they used to do that in the past. Yeah. They used to go to kids and say only you just have to have faith, right? Yeah. Don't question anything. That's not good. What you have to do is to make him an expert in the questions they are bringing, yeah. they are asking. So this is a game change yeah. experience, you know, for yeah. them. Yeah. They can bring whatever question. Yeah. When what the church has to do is to make these kids yeah. and very, very an expert in what he's asking, they are asking. Yeah, wow, that's a, an exciting approach. Yeah, yeah, and it's really the heart of what we're about here at Reasons to Believe is really paying attention to questions that people have, paying attention to objections that yeah. people raise, and then trying to sincerely and, and, and completely engage those questions. Yeah, and depending on, the, on your age, you know, uh, you're looking for different things when you have zero to eight years old, eight, I mean, seven, eight years old, a little kid. You, these kids are more into the enchantment. Mm -hmm. You know, they, they look everything and they get very excited about everything. So mm -hmm. you have to give them everything that is good, mm -hmm. that is beautiful, that is true. So beauty, goodness, and truth has to be the environment where they live. Mm -hmm. But when kids turn 9, 10, 11, so instead of the enchantment, they look for truth. Mm -hmm. So this is why it's so important that that phase, you give them the answers they need. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, one of the, the enduring questions, of course, uh, is, you know, how do we know that God exists, right? Yeah. And um, as a philosopher, you know, you essentially depend upon the laws of logic, right? And even as a scientist, I depend upon the laws of logic. The scientific method is in, in, inherent in it, in its application are the laws of logic, right? Yeah. That, that's indispensable uh, to science itself, uh, probably indispensable to, human, to the human experience. Yeah. Yeah. So we were talking about the idea that the laws of logic actually mm -hmm. can be utilized to make a case that there must indeed be a, a, a God that's responsible for the universe and the world that we live in. Yeah. The point is that if you really look at the situation, you can come up with the conclusion that the laws of logic are not contingent. Uh -huh. They are necessary. Even if you can create other kind of logic, non-orthodox logics, right. 
but we can't talk about those kind of logics without using the orthodox logic. Okay. I mean, we can get rid of the orthodox logic when we're talking about anything, including non-orthodox logics. Right. So, uh, in and if you really think that it is necessary, it must come from a necessary being. Right. And the only necessary being that we, yeah. by definition, is God. So. Right. This is an idea, it's very important idea, it's very powerful. I mean, a, yeah. I mean, we can't think in a different way, yeah. I mean, using a different logical system. Yeah. We, we can create different systems of logic. Yeah. But when you talk about those systems, you can use the same right. orthodox logic. Okay. It seems to be necessary, don't you think so? Yes, yes, so what's some, this is a, a, a lot <laughs> that is quite profound. So let's unpack this a little bit just to make sure those people that are watching this fully mm -hmm. appreciate the, the thrust of the points that you're making. So when, when we talk about, first of all, something that's necessary and something that's contingent, what, what, is, what do those terms mean? How, how are you using those terms? Yeah, Necess if something is necessary, it must exist in any possible world. Okay. That's the good definition of uh, necessary being. Mm -hmm. It exists in any possible world. Okay. A contingent th being is something that can be can exist in one possible world, but not in the other possible okay. world. Okay. Yeah. Right. So you're making the point here then that the laws of logic are are necessary. They're not contingent. Right. That's the point that you're making. Now, when we talk about the laws of logic, and you use this term orthodox logic, yeah. uh, what, what specifically are you referring to with, res with regard to the laws of logic? Yeah, there are three principles uh, of logic, like the identity, non-contradiction, and excluded middle. Okay. So if you obey these principles, you come up with uh, an orthodox logic. Actually, you can obey those and be and get beyond the what you call orthodox logic when you go to modal logic, mm -hmm. uh, different kind of logic that don't deny the three principles. Yeah. But what I'm saying is that we can't make sense of any conversation or thinking if we don't obey, respect right. the non-contradiction, for example. Right. So, so you, again, you said there it's the law of non-contradiction, the law of identity. Yes. And the law of excluded middle. So, so the I, the law of uh, identity is a equals, equals a, a. Yeah. right? Yeah. And the, the and then the law of non contradiction is something can't be a and not a. Yeah. Right. It has to be. It's either a or it's not a, but it yeah. can't be both. Yes. And then the law of excluded middle is. Yeah, excluded middle is something is one thing or the opposite. Right, right. Can be something in between. Okay. Right. Okay. Yeah. But if you wanna get into more details, I mean, something is true or false, right? But not every sentence that has a truth value should be true or false. Okay. That's one thing. But the funny thing is that not every true sentence is a so a sentence that can be proven. Okay. That's another thing. Yeah. You know, it's a, it's a something more deeper. Yeah. De something, something deeper because everything is true or false, but not everything that is true you can prove. Okay. Uh, this is Gödel's uh, okay. theorem, right? And uh, it, I think it also, also points somehow to a necessary being. Right. Because within a logical system, you can prove its completeness. You need some something outside the system right. to deal with it, with it. Okay. This is also something very impressive, in my opinion. Yeah. Now, so in, in effect, are these two ideas distinct arguments for God's existence, or do you see them as... Inter as intertwined in some way. The whole thing is that mathematics is claiming, is speaking out 
that God exists mm -hmm. in many different ways. Uh, if you go to the history of science, for example, in, you know, Einstein did relativity. Uh, he tried to do the cosmological constant. Right. He had to take out the relativity because of mathematics. Yeah. He didn't want to. Yeah. But he had to. So mathematics did that said that he had to do it. I mean, mathematics is a very, very rigid language. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, ha it has these uh, characteristics of being necessary, in my opinion. We can't, as we were talking about, we can't create a different mathematics. We can, but we can't talk about those different mathematics in a different logic. Right. And the other thing is that the, the theorem of Gödel, Gödel's theorem also has a play, has something to say here, mm -hmm. because logic is, no, is not itself a being. It needs someone outside, right. something outside to prove its completeness. Right. So it also points to God. Yeah. So, the, so when you're making this argument, and you're saying that the laws of logic, or let's say the laws of mathematics, are um, are necessary. What's to keep somebody from concluding, well, that that these are actually entities that are greater than God, right? That if if you know God op has to operate according to the laws of logic or yeah. according to the laws of mathematics then why wouldn't we say that those are actually greater than God? So how would you respond to that? Yeah, there are many arguments to respond to that. The first one is that if something is greater than God, the, this thing is God. Right. Because God, by definition, is the thing that you can conceive anything greater. Right. The being that you can conceive anything greater than him, right? right. That's Anselm's argument. Right. In our days, we have uh, the same argument by Plantinga, mm -hmm. Alvin Plantinga. This is Anselm's argument. And the other thing is that uh, logic, the log uh, system of logic cannot be that great because of Gedos theorem. Uh. You know, that's what I'm saying. Uh, this objection would be possible if there was no Gedos theorem. Okay. Because of Gedos theorem, we understand that even logic points to something greater right. outside of it. Right. Right? Did you, yes, did yes, you agree I, with me? Yes, yes. Yeah. I see. I, I follow your, your argument. And so in a sense, then, you would say the laws of mathematics, the laws of logic, even we would say the laws of morality, right, are endemic in God's character, so they, they really are flowing out of God's character. They're not, in a sense, greater than God. Yeah. That's, that's, that's true. I mean, you, as a, we, we said, we can create another diff system of logic, logical right. systems. Uh, no, there were some. Like, right. uh, there's a Brazilian mathematician that create a, created a para-consistent logic. It's a logical system that accepts contradiction mm -hmm. without being trivialized, in other words is a logical system that deals with contradiction and not being trivialized. It means that, because in, in a normal logical system, if you get contradiction, everything can be said after that. Right. So, you no. Know, so the, he creates that system. It's a very powerful one. It has lots of applications for robots, for example. When a robot wants to cross a, a window or a glass window, some sensors will tell the robot that there is an obstacle and some sensors will tell the robot there is no obstacle. I see. So you have a contradiction, right? So how to deal with that? Uh, and the other thing is that also to law. Uh, many years ago, I tried to do that, uh, to law, because in law you have lots of contradiction. You, you deal with contradictions. Even in the legal system, you get like different legal uh, norms that contradict each other. So I try to do that. We can create those things, but we can talk about those things 
in a different way. That we, it, they make, it makes no sense for us. More technically speaking, the meta logic has to be always orthodox. Right. So it's, it's necessary. Mm -hmm. it's, we cannot conceive. We can think about a place where you have like different laws of physics. I mean, the idea that the laws of the today's laws of physics will be the same as tomorrow or the laws of physics here in the States are the same ones that are in Brazil. You, you can prove that, right? I mean, they are contingent. Yeah. But logic is not like that. They have to be the same. Right. So you, we were chatting yesterday and you were saying that, you know, by some interpretations, when people think about the new creation, they see it as a place where there are very different laws of nature yeah. than here. And your point was, but that may be true. And that, again, that speaks to the contingent nature of the laws of, of nature. Yeah. But, um, but that the laws of logic would have to be, in effect, the same. Yeah, for, for what we know, we can't make sense of any other kind of logic. You can yeah. create those systems, but you can talk about those with a different sy logical system. Right. It's really impressive. Yeah. And the other thing, you know, another thing that is interesting, mm. it's, it's very impressive how we understand that. I mean, how we human beings can understand these difficult uh, logical systems. This is not something that, the, that evolution would prove Mm -hmm. Right? It's a. Uh, if you are very, very rational about this, you, you really come up with the idea that it is a miracle. I mean, we, it seems that we were created in God's image and right. therefore we can do such things that any other animals can do, right? Any animals can do that. But we understand like these different logical systems. Uh, it's something that is is impressive. Yeah, and, and you know, because I've I've done quite a bit of work on the whole question of how can we show that human beings are exceptional, and you know, I think the science is increasingly indicating that we really are stand apart from all other creatures. All you know, other animals are capable of communicating, but we communicate utilizing symbols and that we can combine and recombine those symbols to create these narratives. We can then do time travel, mental time travel, where we can anticipate the future and think through alter alternate scenarios that could take place in the future. We understand cause and effect relationships so we can begin to project what happens if we do this, what happens if we do that. And that leads to an ability to solve problems that's very different than how animals are solving problems through associative learning, yeah. right? But we can also then go back into the past and, in 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 a sense, reconstruct alternate, you know, alternate uh, moments that we're in. Yes. If we did something different or something else happened differently, yeah. so yeah. that's that's an incredibly impressive aspect of our nature. Yeah. And I, that. I, I, that I, animals are not doing. Yeah, I, I would just add to that, saying that we can do things to solve problems, difficult problems, but we do wonderful things that don't solve anything. Yeah. We do poetry, we right. do literature, right? Like yeah. symphonies. Yeah, I mean, it's a. Well, you know what's interesting about this idea of um, of human exceptionalism in communicating through, in a sense, language and music and art, which are manifestations of symbolism and this ability to combine and recombine symbols. One anthropologist was arguing that, in effect, most of what we communicate as humans is actually not true, <laughs> right? It's, it, it's, these are alternate scenarios. These are models for what we think is happening, but they are not ex necessarily true communications that much of what we communicate are falsehoods, which is a very interesting argument. And the more you think about what we are saying when we talk as humans, even a scientific theory is really 
a, a it's not necessarily true. It's just a, a model that we've constructed, right? Uh, and his argument is, well, but with animals, you know, animal communication has to be true because their survivability depends upon it, right? But because we create these narratives that are not true, this allows us to have a, a capacity for aesthetics, right? We have this sense of beauty. We desire to create beauty. We appreciate beauty. But now when we, we think about this, that these features that cause us to stand apart, when we talk about logic on top of that, the law, the, our capacity to understand logic and to, to then use logic as a way to constrain <laughs> yeah. these narratives you know, we can create narratives that may not be true, but they all make sense, right? Because of the laws of logic, yeah. right? We can't create narratives that are not true, but that are false, but also don't make sense. If that makes, if, if that seems, makes any sense to you, right? Yeah, I, I would have a different approach. I would say that, yes, it, it is a fact that we create different models and uh, they are not all true. I mean, Newton's mechanics of particles are right. incompatible with the Einstein's relativity. Right. Either one is true, is true, or the other, or right. Yeah. They can both be true because they have different axioms. Yeah. Yeah. You're right. But on the other hand, we seek truth. Yes. That's the thing. I mean, if you create models that are not true and they work perfectly, right. we can survive. Why do you do we seek truth? Right. You know? Yeah. So this is something that points also to an ultimate source. And in my opinion, uh, from God's perspective, truth, beauty, and goodness are inseparable. Uh, I'm saying that when God creates the oceans, the, he looks at the oceans and, and he says, this is good. He does say this is beautiful, right? Because what is good is beautiful right. and it's true. So God, well, the Hebrew word that's translated as good in Genesis 1, yeah. tov, it actually can be translated as beauty. As beauty. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So that's... Uh, that's the thing. We are truth seekers. Yeah. And as you said, no, seeking truth is not something necessary for the survival. Right. But we do. We do. We, right. This is something that enchants us. Right. Uh, in mathematics, the concept of, be of beauty is, is very present. Yeah. Right? Simplicity mm -hmm. is beautiful. Uh, in logic, if you try to demonstrate something, uh, if, if you do that in 17 lines, and uh, you know a friend of yours do it in 15 lines, you destroy it. Yeah. You, your demonstration is really ugly, right? Yeah. If someone else d d do the same demonstration, some same proof in lesser lines that you did, you did something really ugly. That's yeah. the way we talk. Yeah. Say, well, man, you. Your proof is beautiful. Yeah. That's impressive. Yeah, yeah. That's impressive. The aesthetics, the aesthetical element, the axiological element, right. and the metaphysical element are inseparable yeah. from God's perspective. Yeah. It yeah. elevates our soul. Yeah. Right? Yeah. It connects us to the source, yeah. which is God. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, in you know, it is it is interesting because again, to maybe revisit the point, um, when I was discussing the idea that a lot of what we communicate ultimately isn't true, uh, this is in a sense the basis for fictional narratives, for poetry. I mean, it's not to say that there's not truth in yeah. in the narrative, but the narrative itself isn't necessarily true, right? But your point about we're truth seekers is a very powerful point because uh, from an, uh, an evolutionary perspective, there's no value in pursuing aesthetics. Yeah. 
Yeah. There's no value in even pursuing truth. There's no reason we need the laws of logic. We just need to be able to survive, to establish associations uh, with behaviors and and rewards and behaviors and punishments, and that's going to lead to survivability. So the fact that as humans, we we seem to stand apart in in our capacity to utilize language and and communicate through music and and art sep- separates us. But there's even something deeper going on with respect to our pursuit of truth and and uh, our capacity to employ the laws of logic or even the laws of mathematics. Right? It's important that animals know the difference between more and less, but you know, do they need to know uh, mathematical relationships in order to survive, right? Do we need to know mathematical yeah. relationships? Yeah, um, surely you don't need it to survive, right? Yeah. This is something bigger involve, involved. Right. right. Yeah. Now, what other arguments could we make for God's existence that rely on this this distinction between something that's necessary and something that's contingent. We talked about logic. We talked about mathematics. Yeah. What, what mor- morality would fall in that category, yeah. right? Morality. You have aesthetical argument as well, and the ontological argument. Mm. The ontological argument is very powerful. We don't pay attention very much to it. Because some, maybe it's more difficult to... Un- well, to be, if I'm going to be truthfully honest, I don't know that I fully apprehend uh, yeah. the ontological argument. You know, and, and yeah. So, yeah. so... So, I mean, Ansel, unpa- unpack it for me. No, I mean, uh, uh, Anselm, he said that God is the greater being conceivable, right? So this being, if he doesn't exist... He's not the greater being conceivable because this being existing is greater than he, him not existing. Mm-hmm. I mean, did you get it? Mm-hmm. I mean, God is the greater being conceivable, so it must exist. Because if it didn't exist, he wouldn't be the greater being conceiv- conceivable. <laughs> hey, it's, uh, it's powerful. Yeah. I mean, by definition... You can't think anything greater than God. Right. If something doesn't exist, necessarily you have something greater than this being that doesn't exist, which is that same being existing. Right? I mean, the existence of a being makes him greater. Yeah. So the greater being conceivable must necessarily to must necessarily exist to exist. Yeah, that's that's the argument, uh, Anselm argument. It's a, I think it's powerful. Yeah, I mean, in other words, this being is necessary. It's yeah. the same thing, right? Yeah. we started our conversation. I think, yeah. saying this, right? So this being must exist. It must. This being must ex- exist. In, it, it is. Ne- he is necessary. Yeah. And the and the other thing is that. The other thing is that if you think, uh, if a being is necessary, it means that any evidence for him, even if it's evidence for his possibility, means that he exists. Mm. If by definition a being must exist, I mean, if uh, I, I mean, if by definition a being is necessary, God by this definition is a necessary being. So in our world here, possible world we live in, if you have very weak argument for maybe God exists, mm-hmm. for the possibility of the existence of God, it means that. God exists is a principle that mm. we use in the modal logic. Mm. A necessary being exists even if you can prove that he's possible. If a being is necessary and you can prove that he's possible, mm-hmm. 
it means that he must exist. Yes. You see, that's, yeah. that's powerful as well. I mean, you don't need like a huge proof for the existence of God if by definition he's a necessary being. We yeah. just need little proof, small proof, because just to prove that it's possible that he exists, yeah. the consequence of this is that, that he must exist. Right. Like miracles in the churches, people get, getting healed, all that stuff, you know, people... Right. I mean... Yeah. Well, you know, I, I, you know, I think the, the, the argument from religious experience is a very powerful argument, too. Yes, it that, is. That oftentimes people, I find, are afraid to actually utilize, you know, or people don't consider the way that God works in their lives as evidence for God's existence. They've experienced God, but they don't want to, to necessarily draw on that as evidence because they argue, well, this is a personal experience that I'm having. Maybe there's you know, something that's emotional about the experience I have with God. But the fact that you have people that are reliable, that are trustworthy, that are in their right mind, that, not, that consistently uh, have these kinds of experiences not only across the world but through time is a, is a very powerful argument that uh, there must be an encounter that people are having with God because not all of these people can be, can be deceitful, not all these people can be deluded, not all these people, right? Yes. Um, uh, you know that you know can um, can somehow be mentally ill or mistaken, right? That 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 at least one person must be experiencing God, and if that's the case, then then God must exist. There must be the necessity of God. Yeah, I mean, you can go to any church; you will see testimonies that people you know are getting healed in the, not only physical heal, healings. Right. But also healings of the soul, right. relationships that were broken. God. Right. Uh, some years ago, I was in the States and I got invited by Candy Brown, Josh Brown for for lunch, and they. He has a powerful story. He had a tumor in his brain. At the same time, his wife was in the same hospital to deliver their first child. Mm. They are very well prepared professors. I mean, they went to Oxford, Harvard. He, they are Americans here from. They are here from, uh, from here, the United States, United States. And uh, he said, "I wanna get healed." I mean, so he went to different places to get prayed. He went to Canada, <clears throat> and he said, "I, I really wanna analyze the theology to see to see if it's okay." And he he told me. It is so simple that it can be wrong. It's like get healed in the name of Jesus. <laughs> get healed in the, the name of Jesus. So then he got healed, right? And uh, uh, his wife, uh, Candy Brown, that's the inter interesting thing. I mean, the other thing is interesting as well. But this one, <coughs> she got some funds from the university and gathered some people. She did the exams, MRI, and everything that was needed according to the disease. And after that, they had a prayer, in, in, intercessory prayer session, section. And some days later, they did, she did the exams one more time and just compared the exams. And she published a book called Testing Prayer. Mm. Then you can the, the, the book, this book is on Amazon, uh, and she published by by the by Harvard University Press. Mm. So, I think this is a phenomenon that the universities are very biased; mm -hmm. they don't want to study this. But the supernatural is something that's real, right? Yeah. Even the physicists now talk about the supernatural. Penzias, Wilson, yeah. they they understand that uh, the Big Bang actually right. brought into the science the this supernatural discourse. Right. There is something beyond. So we have to right. be more open right. 
to these situations, and I think the universities should study right. this right. a lot. Well, you know, it's interesting to me, uh, you know, because oftentimes you hear this rather, <laughs> frankly, infantile objection against God's existence. Well, if God exists, well, then who created God, right? But of course, as Christians, we would argue God is an uncaused cause. But even if you take a strictly materialistic approach to the universe, you still you have to posit an uncaused cause eventually, right? For the universe, yeah. whether it you know it's Hawking in Lawrence Krauss's you know eternally existing gravitational field, there's still something that is an uncaused cause that exists for eternity. It's just a question of do you ascribe personality to that uncaused cause or not? But so even somebody that is a strict materialist can't escape this idea of, of there being this entity that has always eternally existed. Yeah. Yeah. This question, if God created the universe, who created God, right? They, it's a linguistic error, actually. Yeah. Um, you put in God in the category of things that were created. That's wrong. That's right. a category uh, error. It's right. like asking, what is the taste of yellow? Right. Right? Uh, colors don't have taste. So it's a linguistic error. Yeah. But people keep doing it. But I think it's so easy to realize that you can ask the taste of a color, but you can ask the cause of something that was uncaused. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, this has been a, a fun conversation, Tassos. I appreciate you taking the time to be here with us. Is there anything else that you want to close? And, and by the way, uh, how can people learn more about your work? Um, yeah, I have a academic website. It's called lightcorgo.org, L-Y-C-U-R-G-O.org. And I'm on Instagram as well. It's my name, T-A-S-S-O-S-L-Y-C-E-U-R-G-O. -S -S yeah. Okay. I, I'm working more on the <laughs> idea of social science right now, but yeah. I have a special you know, love for mathematics and logic. I yeah. think it's so, it's beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. It is. All right. Well, uh, thank you again. I appreciate it. For and uh, thank you for watching this episode of Star Cells and God. Uh, remember to uh, like this video, uh, to uh, go to our YouTube channel and subscribe to uh, Reasons to Believe, and then also use the notification button so you are alerted when the next episode of Star Cells and God drops. Love to have your comments. Uh, in the video uh, feed. Uh, we want to know what you think about uh, the idea of logic pointing to the reality of God's existence. Uh, and remember to follow us on social media, RTB underscore official. And then last but not least, uh, keep in mind that the more we know about science, the more that we have reasons to believe. <laughs>